Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're in person. Yeah. Live and in person. Thank you for being here. This is a great moment. I think all of you know that this is the first event of this kind in the Red Theater uh, where we actually have a, an audience uh, for you know, in, in, in more than 18 months by now. So we're so happy that you could come. Next time, we hope we can double the audience. We had many people who wanted to come who were not able to, and so we will be filming, and I will say something about that to remind us from time to time. For now, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be here with these great colleagues, Peter McGee and Manuel Rabate. Thank you for being with us. Uh, let's get started. Uh, this is, as you know, the Vice Chancellor's Roundtable that, is, that my office organizes together with the Career Development Center led by Dana Downey. And I want to thank Dana for helping us launch this series last year, more than a year ago now, when we just did it relentlessly on Zoom. I think we had something like a dozen of them. And the idea of the round table is that uh, I get to speak with extraordinary people, extraordinary leaders of organizations and enterprises from all sorts of walks of industry. We've had leaders from banking and finance, leaders from social enterprise, from uh, diplomacy, we've had ambassadors. Of course, uh, we've had uh, folks who work in investment and value creation, startups. We've also talked quite a bit about uh, arts and media and culture. And what we do is, of course, we, we, we learn about the personal trajectories of these leaders because leadership doesn't come just like that. So you get an insight into, especially for students, I think so welcome, an insight into what are often very unusual professional trajectories. Most of us don't end up in the positions we're in today, no matter where you are in society. You, you know, with, with a clear intent from the age of, age of five or 10 or 15 even, or even 25. So we learn about that and what it takes to do that. But we also drill down into the industries a little bit to demystify them. Because after all, one of the pleasures of my role as vice chancellor is to be able to ask questions that are often not terribly well informed about the industries, but I'm not shy to do it because I think it's of interest to our community to be able to serve all sectors of human enterprise, all endeavors. That's after all what our liberal arts education prepares you for potentially, and it also is propelled by curiosity. And since I'm a very curious person, as you know, I can sometimes ask really questions that are sometimes harder to, 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 to pose if you're just starting out. Questions like, what is the difference between banking and investment banking, which many people don't even dare to ask in an interview, and it's important to be able to do that. We've had, as I said, we've looked at many sectors. We're going to continue to do it. We have a very exciting program li lined up through the year. Uh, you will be able to ask questions after we have our conversation for some 45 minutes or so, and we'll encourage you to do it, and I'll tell you how to do it. You'll be asked to come up to a microphone and to speak through your mask so that we don't have to disinfect the mics. I'll remind you of that uh, when we're uh, getting ready to that part. I said we've talked about media, culture, film, other enterprises, but we have yet to have a serious conversation with an area so very dear to my heart as an art historian and as someone whose career has sort of straddled working in many different kinds of organizations. But my first love, of course, is between museums and the Academy, the Academy of Museums. And so we are very lucky to he here to have with us two leaders of the fast-growing, nascent, world-class museum enterprises that are, that are being built right here in Abu Dhabi and right here on our island, on Sadiat. I will briefly introduce them. To my far right is Manuel Rabaté, who's graced this stage before. He is a very old friend, director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi since its inception. He began to develop it, well, he was the director um, since 2016, when, when the museum was close to opening, but he was very much involved uh, in its development before then. The Louvre has by now welcomed more than two million, well, in its first two years, it welcomed more than two million visitors and made it indeed one of the most visited museums in the world, you know, giving its 
parent institution in Paris, kind of a run for the money. I think that's the most visited museum on earth, maybe besides the British Museum. And uh, of course, since then we've had COVID, but the museum is coming back out of it. And it is already, again, a very lively place to visit. He was previously the Dep deputy director of cultural development of the Musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac, uh, which is the very important anthropological museum, Museum of Culture. Um, uh, uh, when it, it opened uh, early in this century, and he also managed the launch of that museum's first touring exhibitions, uh, importantly. He has really had a long history with museums in France. He was deputy director of uh, the department, really, of public programming, I would call it, for the Musée du Louvre in Paris, and also was very involved there in supporting the creation of the Islamic Art Department, which stands in a very important relation to the Louvre Abu Dhabi here. Uh, he has had a very interesting uh, uh, educational trajectory. He, has, he graduated from Sciences Po in Paris and then the HEC Business School in 2001. And for his many um, efforts, he has also earned, the, was awarded the Knight of France's National Order of Merit for his leadership, well deserved. One thing that is so wonderful about working with Manuel is that he really thinks about universities and learning, and he sees the museum in that way. He chaired a think tank on culture and management, and he's also taught arts and cultural management at Paris Dauphine University, and of course here at the Paris Sorbonne, um, uh, here in Abu Dhabi. Welcome, Manuel. Thanks. Um, Peter McGee, Dr. Peter McGee, um, is the director of the Zayed National Museum that's going up, as we'll hear, and is under construction by the Department of Culture and Tourism, which also, of which, of course, the Louvre is also uh, a project. And um, I'll say a little bit more about him, but what I want to say about Peter is that I feel that I have known him for a very long time because I've read him for a very long time because he's one of the most important archaeologists of the UAE. So if you come here, in 2007 as a, you know, an art historian, but you're really working on all these other things like creating a university. For my spare time and wanting to learn something, Peter's writing has been incredibly important to me. Thank you. He has directed heritage projects here throughout the Middle East since 1994. And he is still, even while he is director of the Zayed National Museum, the head of all of the Department of Archaeology and Paleontology for DCT. Before then, he served for 20 years as a professor and then also as chair of the archaeology department at Bryn Mawr College in Philadelphia in the USA, which is an institution that in size and scope and liberal arts orientation is really much like Enwe Abu Dhabi, uh, I would say. He is extremely well published, more than 50 scientific papers and several books that I mentioned already on the history and archaeology of the Arabian Gulf broadly conceived. He has received too many grants and awards to mention, but I would want to call out uh, 2017, the Sheikh Mubarak Min Mohammed Award for his long-standing services to the UAE's history and archeology. span He too, uh, he came from a different educational trajectory. We'll hear more about it. His PhD is from the University of Sydney in 1996, uh, dedicated to cultural variability, change and settlement in southeastern Arabia from 1300 to 300 BC. One of the things Peter, in those early days when I was reading him and I didn't know him, made me see was how old these cultures here are and how old diversity is in the region, something we talk about a lot today. Welcome to you. Thank you for that Peter. kind introduction. So let's start there. Let's start with the personal journeys. Um, so, Manuel, maybe I can start with you. So, I, I mentioned some of your career milestones, but I want to ask you to go a little deeper into the trajectory. How did you get started on your career, and how did you come to be director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi? That's a <coughs> First of all, uh, Mariette, uh, thank you very warmly to, to have me, to have us, uh, the city family, uh, in one of the first uh, physical sessions. I, I must say, because we, we closed Louvre Abu Dhabi only 100 days, but we were 
struggling with low attendance until now. Uh, we, we saw some changes uh, in the recent uh, weeks. So I, I share the pleasure that you must share of being back into this <laughs> connection space. And I think it's very important. Um, but you can always recreate the logic or, or the obviousness of a career. I, I think there is a lot of serendipity and meeting point and so on. And uh, I was very lucky after uh, my specialization, which was mostly in marketing, actually, uh, even if it was governmental marketing in, in HSA, to, to, to join the Louvre team. So that was uh, meeting point, uh, discussion, uh, interest for the museum, but I was in the auditorium team of a very big museum, so I was... Uh, you know, in a very special uh, hybrid position already. And, uh, and then um, the zeitgeist, uh, the spirit of the president has decided that he wanted to, the president of the French Republic, created an eighth department in, in the Louvre, uh, carving out uh, from the Oriental uh, uh, Archaeology uh, Department a new uh, department dedicated to the uh, uh, Islamic art. And there was the idea to find ways to prepare that by discussion talks, but also concerts. So you could say it would lead me to Abu Dhabi, but no, it's, it's after that I understood it was the first taste. Uh, I joined uh, Musée du Quai Branly because I felt um, excited by the new adventure and, and I wanted to be in, in one of them. I didn't know I would happen to open two museums designed by Jean Nouvel. <laughs> this is a common point. Musée yeah. du Quai Branly is also. Jean Nouvel creation. So, what, was it a sign? Was it a, a pure serendipity? Is, it, is there something? Um, but the meeting points have have a meaning when you when you look at uh, at your life. And similarly, um, I joined the Louvre Abu Dhabi project in uh, 2008. So, um, <laughs> a little uh, after uh, uh, the, the first date you mentioned, but but still uh, quite early in the process and. Uh, I didn't know I would be part of the team to uh, settle, and I didn't know I would lead the French team to settle uh, the, the final phase or the real phase when we merge both uh, teams in Paris and in Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, I didn't know I would become the uh, director before the opening. Uh, it just happened as a succession. Voilà. So in a nutshell, also if you need to have a takeaway from, from um, uh, an experience point of view, I think that the more you open um, your uh, curiosity, the more you create a natural connection, not forced. It's not a networking mm. or, or if, you, if you push it, it will never work. But if your uh, curiosity, which is actually your real nature, uh, drives you into the connection between your academic or uh, professional experiences and the next step, I think that's the most natural way to, uh, to move on. It's such an important point about curiosity and being able to learn and continue learning and be open about that with a certain humility. And I remember meeting you all those years ago. And if you had told me that you were, at the time, I had no idea what Manuel had been up to. I thought he was a very nice art historian or an anthropologist or something like that. So I think it was your ability to master the material at the same time that you had these business skills that were, it's kind of an unusual combination. Let's turn to Peter for a minute. Um, so there are many paths to the museum directorship. Yeah. So same question for you. What is the journey that led to, uh, did all roads lead to the Zayat National Museum for you? <laughs> all roads lead. All roads. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question. And um, I think, you know, Manuel summed it up perfectly. It's, there's a degree of serendipity about it. You, it, it, it is, it is, um, it is not entirely accurate that we, uh, that we create this narrative that we have somehow ended up because of what we've done and where we've been. I feel that there is an element of luck mm -hmm. involved. Um, for myself, I, I went from being uh, uh, finishing my PhD to having a postdoctoral position in Ghent in Belgium um, and, uh, and, and then in Sydney. And I was sort of heading towards a straight academic career, which I had planned, that was the thing that I had planned for. In fact, I had planned 
to you know, be a professor, et cetera, or planned is too strong a word. I had wanted that. <laughs> um, planned suggested there was an inevitability about it, which there certainly wasn't. Um, and, and then after that, I, working here, I became much more interested in um, public knowledge. Um, I, 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 I was struck by the fact that we had been doing a lot of research and a lot of excavations, and so I'm pleased that you had read some of that. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I felt the need to um, ensure that that information became public knowledge. Um, in, in effect, uh, that, that the things that have been discovered in this country, or indeed any country, are first and foremost important to the people that live here. Um, it is a way of communicating about the past, um, archaeology, research, anthropology. Um, and, and so opportunities came up um, to move more into a sort of governmental public facing sector. Initially, uh, just as, a, as the head of archaeology and paleontology with uh, what was in Tourism and Cultural Authority, and then Society National Museum. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of, Manuel said, takeaways, I agree that the, um, you know, the, t the takeaway is that curiosity and a, an absolute willingness to accept the enormity of what we don't know um, is, is absolutely key. So that drives that curiosity, that uh, organized curiosity, um, drives you to sort of always be looking if not over the horizon, slightly to the left and slightly to the right. And I felt that was something which I was lucky at, that I was always looking for something to, um, uh, to create, as I said, that sort of public-facing knowledge. Um, and in a sense, that's where it eventually I ended up where I am today um, as director of Zion National Museum. But serendipity, you know, a word which has obvious connections with the Indian Ocean world in itself, um, serendipity is really important, I think, part of that. And I think that's very important from the point of view that as a, as a young student, I would have felt disappointed if my career had gone in a certain way. And if I could look back at that younger person, I, could have, I would have said, well, there are going to be a multitude of different options that you can explore. I just happened to, to fall into one of those options, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is probably true for art historians and archaeologists. Generally, we're sort of lucky. We have these, for an academic, we have multiple, in the humanities, we have multiple pathways open to us mm -hmm. in these huge organizational structures called museums or archaeological sites and departments and the university. You used a wonderful word about this, organized curiosity. It isn't just about running all over the place and being no. interested in absolutely everything that's on TikTok, although you can learn things on TikTok, I believe that. I, but, but tell me a little bit, in your, do you think that there was something in your university experience hmm. that helped you organize your curiosity? Um, I, I, um, that's a great question. I've, I've thought about where that, where that idea comes from. Um, I think part of it, uh, it's not to do with the university so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was lucky that I was the first PhD student of a, of a sort of very driven, wonderful academic, Dan Potts, Professor Dan Potts, and you know, he was a real inspiration to me in the way he pursued his research. I would say, actually, that one of the things which drove that sense of organized curiosity was um, actually living in Australia. Because mm. living in Australia, you, are, you should be curious about the rest of the world mm. because it's so far away. <laughs> um, and I actually think that was, so uh, archaeology involved travel. <laughs> My first excavation was in Greece, and then in Syria, and then in Jordan, and then in Yemen, and then in the UAE. And all, that travel associated with that curiosity meant that you were becoming aware that there was an enormous world out there. And I think actually, um, I, I wasn't born in Australia. I was born uh, in Northern Ireland. But having grown up in Australia, I think that I was lucky for that reason, because it, it, it provoked a sense of curiosity about the world. It's fascinating. Something about, there's something about that is relevant to Abu Dhabi, I think. I, I think so. As a small, still growing nation, mm -hmm. as so young. Manuel, do you think your university experiences have a lot of relevance with how you approach your job today? And can you talk about that? De definitely. Defin um, in a almost complete, um, not opposite, but a different path uh, than you, Peter. Um, Sciences Po 
uh, in Paris is a school which is uh, uh, presenting humanities, but very, very um, uh, general. So I learned a lot of history, philosophy, uh, but also legal on economics. And so the broadband is actually uh, very, very, very huge. And, um, and today I'm using all of them yeah, and a lot of uh, international relationship. Uh, uh, so in terms of, of uh, for me, it's one of the best schools today to understand the globalization, and, and that's why it's so uh, uh, so successful in Paris. Within its a special status versus the uh, academia, but it's a diversity of of, uh, uh, of of techniques that you can learn and, and fields that you can learn. And, and in terms of techniques, there is uh, a lot of importance given to the presentation, onto the argumentation, onto the structuration. Uh, sometimes too much, but uh, uh, this uh, structuring of element, even when I went to do uh, MBA uh, and so on, I kept this capacity of, of structuring and argumenting. And in reality, um, in a um, complex institution such a museum, you need at the same time to have layers of complexity and to argue very quickly on, 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 a, on, a, on a topic. So. Uh, this, I think, I really kept from, from my studies and from my training. In the MBA, and this is something interesting uh, because you can, you can uh, definitely merge uh, the sources mm -hmm. of training in your life, but in, in my uh, HEC, which is one of the best schools uh, dedicated to, to, uh, to business indeed, um, the, I learned <laughs> some of the techniques that we use in the management, the, the UAE government, and we, we both are working for the Department of Culture and Tourism, but in a way, it's a very, uh, our, our, our common chairman is, uh, likes to say, you, you, you need to think like uh, uh, the government has to be driven like, uh, like a business, with the energy of a business. And I use it, I'm using every, every day the, the techniques of the business to, to, to answer uh, this kind of request. So, this is not the uh, core element of a, of a museum, but uh, a museum is a sustainable uh, entity, so uh, we need to, to know how to manage it. And this, uh, definitely learning management skills. I always think an MBA would have helped me a lot, actually. <laughs> so I'm happy yeah. to hear you say that. You yeah. can bring these things together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Absolutely. Let's zoom out a little bit indeed. You've begun to talk about you know, what museums need to do. Uh, I'm really curious to hear both of you speak a little about what you see as the role of museums today. You've talked about the public function, uh, the knowledge sharing, but there may be more to it. Maybe start with you, Peter. What, what, how do you see I think the role in, in of general, I think that, um, that, that key aspect of, of sharing knowledge, of, of, of breaking down what might appear as um, complicated knowledge, complex knowledge, scientific knowledge, in a way in which it's digestible to the public, I think is a key function of museums. I, I don't want to come back to it, but I will. That, that for, for Zayed National Museum, I want people to leave having understood the narrative and understood what we're telling in that museum but at the same time to have in their minds curiosity about something. So that, that a desire to come back, a desire to understand that no experience is ever complete. Never can you understand any one thing from a three hour, four hour journey to a museum. Um, so I think there's a key element, there's a key role in museums in, in, in conveying that. Um, at the same time, I think that museums have to be civic spaces, they have to, operate to reaffirm uh, community, social, cultural values, and to some extent to challenge them, obviously, as well. Um, I think, so I think the museum as a civic space is something that's very important for me. It's, we're moving, and certainly with Zayed National Museum, that's one of our goals, is to move towards exactly that sort of function, to reaffirm social values, to create social dialogue and the social discourse. Um, uh, it, it's not just about objects on the wall or objects in the showcases. It's much, much broader than that. Well, since you're with us here and you've raised the prospect of the Zayed National Museum playing these roles, which I would fully endorse, can you lift the veil a little? What will be in it? Sure, lots of nice stuff. Tell us, <laughs> <laughs> tell us something. 
Um, well, the, uh, I can briefly review the narrative and what we're doing with the museum. Um, the museum contains uh, seven uh, galleries in, in effect. The first one is, um, is a 400 meter long garden which stretches from the water near Louvre, Abu Dhabi, up to the beginning of the museum. And in that garden, 400 meters long, about 10, 15 meters wide, um, we explore the life of Sheikh Zayed, um, but through the lens of the environmental diversity and ecology of, of the UAE. I am, as you know, really interested in plants and descriptions of plants, and I think there's a lot more that we can do about understanding botanical history here. And then inside the gallery, there's a museum, there's a gallery, inside the museum rather, there's a gallery which deals in detail. It's the foundation gallery of, of the museum, and that it looks in detail at Sheikh Zayed's life um, from his ancestry um, in the late 19th century, Sheikh Zayed I, through um, to the modern day. There's a gallery which explores cultural and ecological environmental diversity within the UAE today. And then upstairs, there's uh, a sequence of four galleries which are situated underneath those wings that you have seen in the renders, which will soon be up and visible. Um, these four galleries take a chronological journey through the museum from you know, the earliest evidence that we have of people or hominids living, living here is well in excess of 300,000 years ago um, all the way through that and, until the modern day. So it's a historical, there's a narrative, there's a thematic um, perspective and the idea is that when people come in, you know, everyone will come in with a different perspective. Everyone will come in with a, a basis of knowledge. Some people will come in with a basis of absolutely zero knowledge or even sometimes negative knowledge. Um, and our goal is to, to challenge each one of those people in a different way. We look forward to it. And I bet there will be some questions from the audience about this. And I could keep talking about this because I'm very curious. But let's uh, ask you the same question uh, about the role uh, of museums in society and how you think about it in relation to the Louvre Abu Dhabi or more generally? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to disagree with what Peter just said. Huh? The, the, so the core, absolute core mission, I think, is indeed to be the custodian of precious artifacts. We're, we're in art museum, huh? in, in this category, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, being the custodian of these artifacts and make them object of knowledge and access. Uh, this is, a, I would say, the, the, the rule absolute is to make sure that the, we protect them and, and, and uh, we, we, we understand them better and we let people uh, study them. On the other side of the, of the, of the spectrum, which is definitely the, the uh, people who are outside the museum and what we do for them, civic place, definitely. I think it's an inclusive place. It's a, a museum is, is a place, it's a social place. It's a, uh, so in the mission of the museum, we are having an effect on the society because of the experience, because of the symbol, because of, uh, because just of the pleasure of being there. This is something very important at Louvre Abu Dhabi. When we reopened, we said we are a mindful museum, which meant also that we wanted to, to listen to our visitors and to offer them a place of uh, maybe solace and, and, uh, and uh, maybe resilience after the, the COVID crisis and, and also to, to rebuild the, all the <laughs> social connection which has been uh, attacked by this uh, pandemic. In between these two very important elements, something which is more specific to us and uh, certainly uh, also to all the city projects and so on, which is um, for us connected, this connectedness. In Louvre Abu Dhabi, we have added one chapter to the encyclopedic, to the Universal Museum, a chapter of connection between uh, people and civilization. And we discover that there is a new way to tell connected history. And I think this is very important. Um, is it storytelling? Could it have, but the, the way, it, as a, at the same time as an object of science to understand the, like our show that you can see today, exploring 8, 800 years of uh, exchanges between the uh, Chinese world and, and the Islamic world, 
these kind of shared stories, or is it when we do a science fiction uh, podcast under the dome with the voice of Jean Nouvel, which is another way of, of discovering the space? This new capacity to tell story, and I think uh, we explored some of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, new model of museum, which are also exploring the storytelling. And I think this may be the new mission, uh, not um, exclusive to us, but in which uh, Abu Dhabi and Louvre Abu Dhabi are, are going to be very strong. There's no question that for someone like me who studied museums for as long as I have and have enjoyed them since I was a little girl, uh, to see what the Louvre Abu Dhabi has accomplished here in Abu Dhabi, in this part of the world, that decenters the traditional way of storytelling in a museum or categorizing knowledge out of France he, to here, it's just transformative and has had great resonance in the world of museum directors. People really look to the museum. So it's really something uh, to be, we want again to congratulate you for that. If you're more interested in that, uh, Manuel and I together uh, hosted a symposium, as many of you know, on what museums were to do now and be now, and that was all online, but uh, last November, uh, reframing museums is what we called it. It had huge international participation and again resonance. And you can hear him say a lot more about that. So if you're more interest, interested specifically in the Louvre Abu Dhabi, I think it's worth looking at some of those um, sessions. But now about um, the role that you play as museum director, you've just indicated these responsibilities are weighty that large, important national and international museums like yours carry. So tell us a little bit, uh, we'll start with the person who's running a museum that's actually open already with Good Manuel. Um, so you can, can learn, <laughs> we can all learn a little bit from Manuel. What does it take? Our students are very interested in that. What, what, is your, what are your days like? What, how do you enact this role of making the museum do all these things, the civic functions, the knowledge functions, the storytelling, what, what, what do you do all day? <clears throat> my days on my nights. Uh, <laughs> days and nights. Um, it's, a museum is a very, very um, polycentric, complex organization in which, um, uh, so the collection is definitely at the core, and this is um, the onion theory within the museum, like the people in charge of the core and, and the curators, the collection managers, will be really the, the first, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the key resource of a museum. And, and, and as a museum director, um, you need to make sure that this team can operate and that we are always uh, uh, say, um, taking good care of the artworks and uh, presenting them to the world. If we, what I call the onion theory is like there's another layer, which is the uh, people who will not necessarily take care of the artwork directly, but will help into this uh, safekeeping. So they can be uh, the educator, the mediator, and this is all, all the function of, uh, uh, in, in French we have a, a word which we're trying to, um, to translate to English, uh, mediation but uh, interpretation, uh, uh, which is all, all the people, on, in, in French it's clear because it media, so you're in between, mm -hmm. the, uh, be between the audience and the artworks. This is the key, this is the education, this is the uh, publication, pro public program, uh, but uh, now the digital is really important. But you also have all the people who are uh, helping, protecting the artworks, you have the security, you have the technician. The museum is an incredibly complex, uh, you need to control the climate, you need to control the uh, hygrometry, you need to control the temperature, you need to make sure that nothing moves, nothing is stolen, of course. So all of this has to work together in a very uh, uh, complex ballet of uh, uh, several, uh, I mean, it's one community of, of uh, co-workers, but there are uh, various communities of, of specialists. And around that, you have the people who will make sure that the museum works as an entity and, and thrive, and this is, uh, many more on the business side, but uh, uh, all the functions that you need, uh, of course, uh, HR, finance, procurement, and so on, but also all the people who will bring you uh, resources and visitors and, and marketing come, and, and how do you communicate on a very specific object, which is, uh, uh, as we said, even complex to, to tackle and to, and to say. And uh, how do you organize tourism? How do you make sure that groups can arrive? So 
all these people are working together under uh, the stewardship of uh, your servitor in, in my case, but in, in a, uh, at a very, you have people who are really passionate by their work. Um, they need to have a great autonomy in their capacity. Mm -hmm. So the museum director has to be able to make sure that everything is working without substituting, without entering into each complex field. And I think this is one of the challenges, is to make sure that the, uh, the system is working without being uh, trapped by it. W which means, again, a takeaway, and maybe you will take a uh, couple more on, on what kind of um, experience can come for you, but there are many, many, many uh, doors to enter this system. Mm -hmm. And that's why a director can come from various backgrounds. There is one cursus honoris, uh, uh, in the system, which is uh, art historian, which is the most uh, specific and, and, uh, and classical uh, and obvious one, because it is the core. But there are many ways to create these uh, interactions between uh, all these uh, professional fields. It sounds indeed as if you are a human systems integrator, right? You're really making these different areas of expertise interact well to deliver those products. I want to come back to that in a minute, but Peter, to develop a museum, what does a museum director do? So that's a great question, and I, I well, I just have to watch what Manuel does, and I'll learn. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think you know, Manuel was talking about the systems, establishing these systems of operation in which these different units within the museum structure are, are operating. Um, uh, you know, maybe within separate sort of organizational chart aspects, but they're also integrating into the one cause of the museum, um, the one goal for the whole museum. As, as a, it, it, in terms of Zion National Museum, we are still at very much a startup phase. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing at the moment, one of the challenges is that we can start to see the structure, um, the organizational structure of, of the museum emerge. We're starting to see the different sections working. We're starting to see the the way in which um, uh, duties, responsibilities are assigned across that organizational chart. So one of the things that I find quite interesting about this particular startup phase is it provides an opportunity to create an environment where we are truly working as, as a team. If you can create that sense of teamwork, if you can create that sense of, okay, this might not strictly be my responsibility, it might be another section's responsibility, but I'm gonna jump in and help Having a small team, which I have now, um, you know, probably it'll be about 20% of what the final team will be in terms of size. It provides an opportunity to create exactly that sort of, um, um, that way of working together. Mm. And I think that, I, I find that challenge really rewarding and interesting because it's immediate, it's there, and it needs to happen. We need to establish these ways of working together. So when we are uh, a fully fledged organization, we've established the essence, the spirit of what, what will make the team work inside National Museum. There are plenty of other um, challenges as well. That's more an organizational personnel one, a human systems one. Um, building the collection is, is obviously a major challenge. We're very lucky, I think, in the UAE in that, uh, and particularly in Abu Dhabi, that there's been such extraordinary sort of archeological research that's been happening for the last 30, 40 years that there, is, there are large collections which tell the story of the country quite well. Um, but the collection building is still, uh, you know, is still one of the main focuses of what we're doing. Um, uh, establishing a narrative, we have a narrative, we know what we want to tell, iterating it constantly so we're getting it right. That's, you know, we never, one of the things I tell the team is, you know, if, we, if something's not working, Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. But at a, at a point, you can say, let's just put that, we have the luxury to say, let's put that aside and let's try to do it a completely different way. So, and that's something we've been doing um, recently with, with some of the challenges of the museum. And I think at, it, at this stage, all of those, that, that flexibility, that way of um, being adaptable to the challenges as they come up, that's, that's the biggest part of what we're doing in this sort of startup phase, I think. It's fascinating to hear you talk about that because to some degree, Emily Abu Dhabi, 11 years young, still feels in startup phase. And yeah. what you say is so meaningful, I think, to any organization, any business, any enterprise, 
staying open to doing things differently. Yeah, always. Even if it has seemed just the right thing at a certain phase in a year's time, it may not be and you need to regroup. And I'm, I think we can all give a, examples And I think also, just to pick up on that, is encouraging people to express doubt, I mm -hmm. think is enormously important. Encouraging people to raise their hands and say, actually, I'm not sure we're doing this the right way. I, I, I hope that I've established that in the team so far and that something will continue. It's beautifully said, and it reminds me of your earlier kind of thinking about how your university related to what you're doing in your university career. And I wanted to ask you, having spent myself time on archaeological digs, it occurs to me that as an archaeological site director, yep. you're using some of the muscle of what it takes to, to tell us about being an archaeologist and how it isn't just Indiana Jones. It's not, uh, yeah, it is, it, unfortunately it's not, or perhaps fortunately, it's not Indiana Jones. Um, so I've directed uh, field projects here and elsewhere for, for a number of years. Um, and I would still like to do it more. In my current position, I tend to sort of not be in the field much at all, which I miss. I love being in the field. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, as a dig director, there's, there's logistics, there's organization. A key part of, of, for me, what was being a dig director was trying to, um, exactly as I was saying, just encourage, encourage the questioning, encourage vocalization of doubt. But the key element, the thing which I think I learnt a lot from, which I hope that I've brought into this museum project, is um, to be extremely conscious of the fact that our knowledge is fragile. Um, that our knowledge is open to interpretation and that we, um, we have to embrace. I, I said to you earlier when we were talking backstage, you know, there's this quote, I think it's by Machiavelli, there are people that know, there are people in the world that know everything and that is all they know. I think that's hugely important. Um, we, we, we embrace what we don't know. And I, as a dig director, I was always sort of saying, someone would say, let's dig there because you can see something. Well, that's exactly the reason not to dig there. It's a bit obvious. Go where you think there's nothing and try that out instead. And it works sometimes, and other times it doesn't work. Yeah. You have to be open to failure. Uh, I, but that's a wonderful statement. I, I hope everybody heard that one. Uh, uh, Machiavelli, I think, as you said, uh, there are people in, in the world who know everything, and that is all that they know. Yeah. And I think for academics, that's a really hard one. It's um, <laughs> No, uh, sorry, my, um, I may have forgotten two concepts which will be um, of great use uh, for Peter because it's also transposition of this mm -hmm. organization of, of resources and meaning that you, yep. you have between um, uh, indeed the archaeological work and the museum uh, management. Uh, the two P's, uh, programmation and planning. Yep. Basically, in this complex ballet, um, it has to come from the directorate at one point that you stabilized the programming, the programmation, what's happening, what's the content which is being developed. It doesn't mean that it comes from the director because you, in my case, I'm relying uh, enorm enormously on, on, on Soraya Nujaim uh, with the scientific director and on the various partnership. But the moment we stabilize and we close yep. the programmation is absolutely and in parallel, the planification of what is really happening. You know, it's a museum which receives, so these precious artworks, flows of public, shootings, CNN coming, uh, you have a, a movie on development, uh, restoration, the Abu Dhabi municipality. I mean, just without being too anecdotal, the superposition of these elements needs to be uh, organized, and this is uh, the planification of what is happening on, on the in the space and in the time of the institution. And this has to be owned by the director. Mm. If not, it's just a, a, a buzz and, and not a structure. Totally. No. Sorry, That's I'm, a very good mm -hmm. additional so clarification. Me, Thank you for that. So each of us leads a non-profit organization. It doesn't mean it's of great profit to those who benefit from it in all sorts of ways, not necessarily financial, but really especially in terms of human development, societal development, civic space, knowledge production, and so forth. Nevertheless, so, muse so here you are. So as museum directors, you have to produce new knowledge, preserve it, tell the stories around it, gather people around it, help us 
see each other's humanity, all these things that you have to, you've been talking about. And your programs do this. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you are sustainable financially. We're still also, there are business propositions in nonprofit organizations. This is often not fully understood by people who go into profit, nonprofit work. How do you handle some of the inevitable trade-offs between financial sustainability and success and uh, all these things that you want to do that essentially are not really a business proposition per se? Maybe we'll start with you since you're, you've been doing it very actively in many museums it's, uh, yeah, over um, time. I, I know. Uh, maybe if we start by de-zooming in the world, um, you have the private museum and the public uh, museum. The private museum needs to uh, break even or they die. And unfortunately, during the COVID crisis, uh, yeah. some had to close because if they were not in capacity to, to, to recapitalize or just to, um, to get some cash flow, they, 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 they had to stop the activity. The other side of the museum world is composed of government or, um, or uh, local uh, entities. And in a way, the question of sustainability is, can be translated if, on what is the acceptable burden for the public uh, budget. And how do we justify this burden, not as a static burden, but as a dynamic social investment. So how do we do trade-off? In Louvre Abu Dhabi and soon in ZNM, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I will say in Louvre Abu Dhabi. Yeah, uh, I will let you uh, answer the question after. Uh, but in, in Louvre Abu Dhabi, we are uh, stabilizing the model. We are a young museum. We opened four years ago. And my, my job was to give uh, readability to Abu Dhabi government of what it would cost based on several hypotheses for, for the years to come. Unfortunately, my, my little system was a little challenged by a uh, COVID uh, crisis, but we are recover, we're recovering, and now we, we need to be back on the trajectory. It means what can we get out of the ticketing? What can we get out of the, this trade-off? We are free for the children up to 18. Mm -hmm. We have uh, for, for the student and for the above 18, and for the teacher, we have because they are massive users of us, and we need to have a special relationship. We have created uh, heavily discounted uh, card, a little less than 100 uh, dirham, on purpose to make it accessible. It's dumping, but at the same time, I'm creating. So this kind of trade-off, I need to know exactly what kind of revenue I will generate. And when I'm uh, diminishing my uh, hope of revenue, why does it serve? What does it serve? So that's for the ticketing on, on the visitation. And then you need to be creative in multiplying or adding new revenue uh, um, elements. So you can do a little bit of uh, self-promotion. Uh, you have a fantastic restaurant in, uh, <laughs> called Fouquet's, uh, not far I do from like here. Your uh, we just opened, sorry, uh, <laughs> just uh, after all, it's part of the diversification of resources. We just reopened the uh, Art Lounge, which is, so, adding different level of food and beverage, retail. Uh, I was mentioning the shootings. Uh, when, when we rent the space without depreciating what we are, um, uh, and even we can become more famous out of it, it's a great source of diversification. When we can use our brand on T-shirts, mugs, and so on, we are multiplying the sources of revenue. Can we go up to the break-even? I don't know. This is a discussion, very mm -hmm. tonic discussion I'm having with our bosses, with the comments. Like, I'm, I'm, it's difficult when you, have, when you are changing or creating, transforming a, a new uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think it's definitely healthy and positive to, to, to have to justify and to understand why you do things. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm very proud of this student and teacher path. I want to keep it. We will keep it definitely. Uh, and because it's our one of, not the only one, but one of our connection with the academic world and, and a way to say welcome. Ideally, it would be free. Everything would be free. But having it, the, that's an, a good example of a trade-off which I can live with. And I think it's, uh, uh, it, has a, it has a meaning. 
Very good. Thanks. Uh, Peter, what are we going? What, what's the restaurant going to be at the side? Well, we, are, um, we don't know we, yet. We are we're exploring yeah. that next. We're starting the process next week. In fact, yeah. to um, to explore the the F and B, the food and beverage offerings. Um, exactly. I you know I would only mirror what Manuel has said. I think this issue of sustainability is very important. Right. We we are absorbing public money, and we have to be incredibly responsible with it. I. I and part of that responsibility is exploring um, uh, revenue opportunities where they exist. With the case of Zide National Museum, we are very conscious that, you know, the ways in which we can explore revenue, we have to be cautious about the way in which that might impact the museum, but at the same time, um, be imaginative and thoughtful and, and conscious, as Manuel said, you know, whether or not uh, the break-even point is reached, that part of our job is to raise at least some at least some revenue which offset the operational costs and investment so um, at the moment we're at the stage where we're still exploring that and as Manuel said you know we don't we don't want to impact we can't talk about being a civic space but impact that we have to we have to be very conscious that the museum is accessible that that people are able to enjoy it that they're able to go there and um, um, engage in, in the narrative and the message in a way which which financial sectors shouldn't necessarily restrict so it's a balance in the end i think um, but i the i i'm very keen on the idea and i think it's extremely important to remember that that you know this is public money but it's it is we have an enormous responsibility an absolutely enormous responsibility um, to use that money for the creation of knowledge for the creation of public perception for the creation of um, altering people's perception for pro pro provoking curiosity um, all of those things are in a sense the uh, added to the fiscal revenues which we would generate mm -hmm. yeah. so you see an enormous sense of responsibility on the part of museum directors which i fully endorse and is maybe something that's evolved much more strongly in this century than it was for much of the 20th evolving story always, but a sense of the museum as a public good, especially museums that have large public subventions. But that's even true for many so-called private museums in the United States, which after all are often tax exempt. <coughs> that is also public money. Ultimately that's withheld, that's right. you could say, over yeah. real estate taxes and so forth. So museum, so I think it's really great to hear the two of you talk about these areas of revenue. Of course there's tickets, memberships, grants for research, uh, maybe renting out space sometimes for events, uh, FMB and so forth. Especially but in the end, public. the public subvention, it will always kind of be critical, I think. Uh, uh, please, Manuel. No, 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 so, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm cutting you, but uh, I forgot another P uh, again. Um, the financial P, which is uh, exactly what you are mentioning, and, and it's um, a great source of revenue or support, because great philanthropy can also be um, gifting artworks mm -hmm. or, or gifting uh, archives or, 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 or a full uh, library of, of, uh, of a scholar or, or an art historian or, or an artist which can be given. So, the, uh, of course, uh, the most <laughs> the easiest to use is, of course, uh, money uh, in cash. It can be uh, also uh, uh, getting a value in kind. But the um, another aspect of the museum is to be able to generate the desire for corporation and or um, individuals to also support the civic mission and, and the mission, its, its existence. And so most of the time they don't help that much for the existence and they will be more driven by a mission. Mm -hmm. So the question is how can we uh, create the understanding of the mission we have to make sure we can receive uh, support. And knowing the size of the investment Abu Dhabi is doing on this field, there is a, a little challenge for us today to convince that we really need this support on specific element. I think uh, Zaya National Museum will attract other type of uh, philanthropy or other uh, uh, think back uh, to the state that we cannot attract we have people who, will, who are uh, excited by the Louvre Abu Dhabi narrative, and they find something in it which is an, uh, an echo of their culture, for instance, and they would have this kind of interest. But what is the entry point on how can we structure in a um, less uh, tax-incentivized environment the culture of philanthropy 
uh, that's uh, our common challenge. Mm. It's a challenge, but I hear both of you say that any to have success in any of these revenue generating areas, whether it's tickets or philanthropy or even a restaurant wanting to be there, first your mission has to be clear and authentic yeah, and seen to be useful to the public. This is such a great conversation. I have so many more questions, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, I think there's a mic. I can't see. It's right there. There it's, it is. It's lighting up. Uh, please ho keep your mask on. Please step up, and the mic can be adjusted for you if needed. But please really uh, feel free. As you can tell, these friends are really willing to engage with us and answer any questions, and I certainly have more of them, but I really want to encourage you just to just get up and go up there. This is not scary anymore. We're in a different phase now of the pandemic. Yes, very good, oh, yeah. please. And please say who you are and what your uh, role is at Amu Abu Dhabi. Okay. Um, hello, thank you so much for such an insightful conversation. Um, my name is Rania. I am a second year student and I'm majoring in philosophy. Um, and I was just kind of interested to know what do you think set you ahead for such successful careers outside of your classroom and outside of your academic knowledge? What kind of opportunities did you create for yourself while you were a student that kind of got you where you are now? Thank you so much. Please, After you, either one of you oh, or both. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's luck, a great question. <laughs> luck on curiosity. Um, no, uh, I think uh, follow your patients, your, your, what you love passionately. My interview to work at the Louvre, I send my CV, etc. a complex story. I, I had um, a, a booking to go and see the very night a great artist called Olivier Cadio, a show at Théâtre de la Colline. And I, and I, I, I said, so I called, I, I happened to speak to the guy who was interviewing me, bypassing the uh, assistant, I don't know how, and I said, I'm available when you want, but I need to be at Théâtre de la Colline at 8. And he answered, don't worry, I'm going to. You, <laughs> yeah. you. So, was I incredible in the interview or not? At least we had a connivence. I had all the pedigree and so on, but the, and if it didn't work out, it wouldn't have worked out. But this, uh, uh, if you want to work in culture, if you want to work in museums or in the other cultural, in, I think your cultural uh, passion will, will help you and, and you don't need to force yourself, it's the opposite. Let it go, do it, uh, and, and uh, enrich your experience with that. That, for me, that was a moment where I, I went beyond the pure process and, and became uh, connected. Yeah, that's a really great question. I've been, I asked Manuel to speak first, so I had time to think about it. <laughs> and I'm not entirely strategy. convinced that that time served me very well because I've overthought it now. And um, I have to think quite more simply. Um, I think there are these moments like that where, where things sort of come together, the, these moments of, of synchronicity where things just fall into place. Um, you know, many years ago, I, I was at a conference in London and I was just sitting with someone and they said, I, I've got this colleague in the British Museum who's doing this project in Pakistan. Would you like to meet him? And I said, yes, that sounds, that sounds interesting. And, we went and had a cup of tea and we just sort of instantly hit it off. And he said, do you want to come work on this project as the co-director? So it was like, oh, okay, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. Um, so there are these moments of connection, human connection, which I think are extremely important. And part of that is, is also um, you know, being open to opportunities, like uh, being, I think, being willing to explore um, options, being willing. I, I'm always... Coming from an academic background where I had PhD students and the students would ask similar sorts of questions like how, how are you successful? And I guess I am. Um, that, that part of it was um, never um, when you're asked about you know, meeting people in, in professional capacity or exploring an option or, or, um, or you know, in, investigating perhaps a, a way of moving your career in, in, a, in a pivot in a different direction, um, that the, you, you always regret if you don't explore it. 
you always regret like not taking the opportunity to um, to see what it's about, to have a conversation. I think that, and part of that is then being open to to working in different places, working in different countries, experiencing different things. Um, uh, yeah, all of that I think uh, plays a role in it. Uh, you, there's always anecdotal stuff. There's, we have anec we have anecdotes, but it's more about being open and um, uh, uh, having having those conversations. I'm trying to think of other things which have guided me um, to be in the position I am now. I, um, it, I mean, it's my passion for this country, passion for the, for the history and archaeology and the culture of this society, which I've been. I've been involved in for 29 years this year, um, one way or another. Um, but there's other things as well. I think, I think uh, Manuel said that you have to embrace your, what you're interested in culture. Don't, don't force it. I think that's exactly right. Don't force it. Let, I've become incredibly interested in medieval Islamic cuisine. This is my new thing. I'm really, really, really interested in this. Stay and, tuned for uh, that restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, we know. <laughs> and um, and because I, I, I enjoy cooking, right? I, 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 I like, I'm a decent, I'm an okay cook. Um, that, so that's something which is enjoyable and it's tactile as cooking, but then it becomes a sort of like intellectual exercise and, but not an overbearing intellectual exercise. Like, okay, where does that spice come from? Why, why would they have star anise with black peppercorns in this dish? All of these sort of things are ways of expanding the way I think about stuff. And for me, um, that, that is key. And sport. Sport's a really nice metaphor for so many things. Mm -hmm. Do you but play I, sport yourself? I did. I used to, I, 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 have, um, I have played football, um, soccer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just a bit too old for it now. But, um, oh. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm a big fan of um, team sports. I think team sports mm -hmm. are a great way to learn to work together. I, 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 I honestly think all of my children have been forced relentlessly to play football <laughs> for that reason. Oh. These are wonderful uh, insights and suggestions. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, several people. You can, I see you there too. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We can flow this perfectly. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Amina and I'm a first year student here. Um, planning to major in either political science or Arab crossword studies. And I really thank you for this opportunity, especially because it's in person. I think we've all craved for some social interaction, even if it's social distanced. Um, my question would be, you touched upon the digital developments of uh, museum exhibitions or the, the work of museums. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you see to be the digital era of museum work and where do you see that going forwards? You're both in the middle of this, yep. so please. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a very complex tree, uh, the answer to digital in a museum. You have one branch, which is definitely the digital as art, and it's for me, and NFTs, um, uh, multimedia, etc. So the digital is the source of creation and, and so This is for the very contemporary uh, uh, art museum and, and uh, uh, it's a, just a new, for me in this case, and this is not our specialty, it is just a new medium and we need to see what will stay or not stay and, and uh, uh, print and photography change completely uh, history of art. Maybe it will, maybe it's a little after. We don't know it's a phenomenon which is happening. Uh, we need a little bit time to understand the, the real transformation. There is another one which is the, and I go back to our French uh, word, uh, mediation or interpretation, in which, uh, especially during the COVID crisis, but of course before, we understood the power of uh, animated uh, moving image and here, there's a, a huge debate on coexistence of the image. Um, again, I'm in the art museum, huh? not, not uh, in the civilization museum where uh, maybe the image is the thing that you are showing, but in the art uh, and archaeology museum, um, uh, we need to have a sort of an ethic 
of the digital to know how it's interfering because uh, it's too seducing. <laughs> so yeah. it can be a gadget, it can be a di diversion, it can be, um, it can be, a, uh, it can even lie to you in making you believe it's easy when it's not easy. But it can also be a fantastic tool of knowledge dissemination, but also desire because uh, you can uh, make it, uh, you can uh, really fuel the, the. So for me. Um, uh, we just, uh, as you rightfully say, we're so happy to be back together. <laughs> so we had a, uh, uh, if you were to do a curve, you had a big peak of digitalization and everybody going completely crazy. Now, people are so happy to be back in the in this physical space. And I think that the reality is that the system had a sort of hysteresis effect, you know, when the system restabilized at yeah. another level. And we will be now working on the, um, uh, cleverness or the uh, pertinence of hybrid model with uh, population, global population, which uh, overall uh, progressed in the digital use and need and control. And this, the way we will use it, the way we will tell story will definitely uh, uh, say if we are um, uh, pertinent or not. It's a really interesting point, Manuel, because you know, we when when the when the pandemic started in March um, last year, probably a little bit before, um, as a museum which hadn't opened but was still building its programming, and exactly as Manuel was saying, you know, solidifying and closing its programming and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, I was observing how um, operating museums um, coped with with the pandemic and the way in which it suddenly there was this explosion of of optimism that everything was possible, that everything could be digital, that everything, the digital experience, um, the virtual museum, uh, you know, this stuff was June, July, August, everyone was embracing uh, this idea. And I always felt, and I think it comes back to being an archeologist where we deal with the materiality of objects, mm. um, is, that, is that nothing replaces in person, nothing replaces seeing an object up close and physical. There is, there is no, no substitute for that. But the digital world is excellent, um, as, as the user term, Manuel, in terms of mediation, in terms of taking an object which might otherwise be obscure and difficult and explaining it. And I think that that is where the future of, of the digital component of museums lies. I am, I'm personally not so embracing of the fact that we can be, um, that everything can be virtual. I think there's a there's a physical nature to being in a space, uh, beautiful architecture, next to beautiful paintings, next to beautiful objects, which which we absolutely need. Um, and I was, I, the pandemic hasn't been lucky. It, it, it was a, a, an awful tragedy, but I've personally found that as a team, we were lucky to be able to observe that, to observe those very quick shifts in the trajectory, because it was like month by month that was changing the discourse. Um, we were able to sit back in a museum which hadn't been open and learn from what people were saying. And I, I think we as a team did learn a lot, actually. Yeah. I, th these are such important observations, which of course I readily endorse. And I, I do remember, Manuel, this beautiful talk you gave really in some of the darkest moments of the pandemic last year about what art can do for us in a time of crisis. Maybe one second on this, and then we'll take one more question. But how do you reflect on that now, looking back? What did we learn? I, did we uh, learn something new about what museums are, no, no. even while they were closed? No, no, I think uh, the, 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 I did, I mean, the number of people <laughs> now coming back to the galleries and, and the desire to see the materiality of the artwork mm -hmm. and, and to be together, also to share the experience of, of, uh, of uh, seeing the artwork is definitely a, a, a testament of, of, of this. Uh, um, we are exploring for the museum um, the next step, which would be the art therapy and how can, really, uh, can we really use art to cure. Today, I would definitely say that uh, the museum has a space with artworks and with all this uh, equipment to make you feel 
engage is participating to the resilience of the society. Definitely. I, I, I don't have tangible elements, but uh, uh, we, we should work uh, maybe with one of your sociology uh, uh, students on, 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 the, on, on the ground to see how, uh, how, how this transformation is happening. The uh, one of the next uh, phase, not the only one, but uh, following what Nathalie Bondil, who used to be the uh, head of the, of the Montreal uh, Museum of Fine Art, and now uh, she's the uh, head of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Institut du Monde Arabe uh, mm -hmm. uh, section, uh, Museum and, and Programming. Uh, and she, she was very strong in, in, in developing uh, uh, art therapy. And in Canada, they managed to have um, the possibility for the doctors to prescribe art as, as part of the, the social. So I, I, I do think that, is it anecdotal? Is it a real transformation? Is it a way to say to the society that it means it, it is a change? I, I, think it, it, I think it actually matters. And I think it's actually a very, uh, very strong way of, of uh, um, re-justifying the importance of art mm. and of artworks and of artists in the society. So uh, I, I believe even more, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having more tools to justify it and to keep on building this narrative. Well, we look forward to that and to that potential collaboration, of course, with both of you museums. I would agree that since art is such a, clearly such a human need and production, artifactual production, even if we don't call it art, the art made by others can help us see things about our own humanity and that of others. And maybe that is the source of that therapeutic potential. Not all art is nice. I want to underscore that. Art can also be very difficult, but even so help in that kind of work that you, that you describe. I saw a question, please. We're gonna take our last question because as we heard, museum directors have busy evenings as well for many of those development opportunities you heard. But please, let's take a last question here. Um, I wanted to ask a completely other question. What's your name, please? Sorry, my name is uh, Jahan Al Khatib. I work at the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology and Science Communication. <laughs> so Great. I wanted to ask a completely different question, but when you spoke about art therapy, it kind of like made something tick in my head, is that how can you create a multi-sensory a museum experience. How can you make sure that when someone walks into your museum, all their senses are engaged and the user can experience it in all different ways? Thank you. Uh, we already have a few. Huh? Mm. Um, the, of, of course, the, the most important one is the, uh, the, the view uh, on, on the most obvious. The, <laughs> the one that we're trying to stop is that sense of touch even if we can uh, find the uh, derivative of it. Um, we discovered uh, before the opening uh, in the inclusivity approach, the importance also of sound. And, and, uh, and for people of determined, for anybody who has a challenge in, in viewing the capacity to recreate and to describe, and you know, it's a different way of, of uh, mm. doing uh, interpretation and, and helping people understanding uh, by uh, describing um, uh, but it's also for, for, for um, everybody, uh, you can enjoy with music, a museum you can tailor. We, during the pandemic, we worked with Anrami, which is a, a Middle East a leading platform of music, and, and they curated a uh, soundtrack based on our values, more or less the duration of a visit of Louvre Abu Dhabi, one hour and a half, which is the average. So you could be, you know, Maybe I want to learn about the artworks. Maybe I would just want to have a fantastic uh, musical uh, trends or experience in the gallery. And, and for me, it's okay. It's, it's, a, it's a good uh, way. The um, uh, taste is definitely covered by Fouquet, but if I'm, uh, if I'm pushing too much, uh, <laughs> uh, and we could curate uh, a little bit more. And the, the smell uh, is um, very specific. Some institutions do it. We have 
today we are um, a little cautious about it. Maybe uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's used in some of the exhibition uh, in the roots of Arabia we, to, in order to understand sometimes uh, the, the essence. Uh, um, we, we had some olfactive. Uh, it can be very gadget or it can be very, very, very powerful as an experience in the museum. Mm -hmm. So the multisensorial, uh, uh, sorry, you must know a lot more than what I do, but the, 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 on the five senses, on how do you uh, integrate them into a mu museum experience is definitely uh, evolving uh, uh, approach and, uh, and uh, um, from an inclusive point of view and from an experience point of view it's definitely uh, one of the new frontier. Uh, I mentioned Souraya Nujain, our, our scientific director. She, she has a project in developing more uh, sensor, sensorial uh, uh, section in the intersection because you need you need uh, you need to have the space you need to have the capacity to create uh, an immersive uh, if, if you want to do it properly at, at the right level and, and and we are brainstorming on, on it so if you want we can <laughs> we can discuss after i think um i i just to add to what manuel said i think if we're talking about a multi-sensory expression uh, experience in terms of Zayed National Museum, one of the things that drives our visitor experience journey is acknowledging is um, is acknowledging that not everyone has the same five senses and they don't operate the same way, and um, and that, that we are extremely focused on inclusivity as a as a way of of welcoming um, guests to the museum, and um, I think that's the first sort of thing I'd say. That the the second thing is that we are also in in inside National Museum, we're lucky that we do have this outdoor mm -hmm. gallery. We have a 400 meter long outdoor gallery, <laughs> which, which the ecology and the environment of which carefully planted, carefully manicured, I guess, um, from, the, from the coast through to the desert, through to the oases, and then to the, to the museum itself. Um, I'm a very big fan of the fact that that the sense of smell is extremely important, and I agree with Manuel. For for museums to get this right is difficult. It it, it can be tacky, and that's what you have to avoid at all costs. But in terms of that, and we are exploring it actually inside the galleries for some some um, uh, some potential uses. Um, but but for the outdoor. Um, experience and there is nothing you cannot describe what it is to sit under a raft tree in the desert unless you are sitting in a raft tree under the raft tree in the desert <laughs> you can't you can't it's it, it, you maybe you could do it but you know the smell the 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 slight scent of the tiny yellow flowers that appear in the spring I mean all of this um, I think for, for this outdoor gallery is, will be a fantastic experience and it's one I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. These are such great questions and yeah. wonderful uh, ruminative answers. I hope that you've gotten, if, apart from the incredible range that these two extraordinary museum directors have, that you've gotten a sense of all those areas of knowledge and interest they talk about aren't just their curiosities, although those are important, they also translate into departments, jobs, and opportunities to contribute to the knowledge and civil society organizations that museums are. Growing up as an art historian, as a graduate student, I always thought, okay, in museums you have guards and you have art historians like me who become curators and the director. You just heard that that isn't true at all. It wasn't even true when I was a graduate student all those many years ago, although it was a little bit more true than mm -hmm. it is today. But really, museums, and especially in Abu Dhabi, where, which is so rapidly developing this field, there are great opportunities that probably translate into internships and possibly positions you might want to try at some point. I want to thank Manuel and Peter so much for being so generous with their time and their thoughts with you. And I hope this is the first of many more conversations with Emil Abu Dhabi to come. And I thank all of you for being here. Be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.